special story we're getting into the final five of our countdown and what better way to start the top five than with the continuation of a story that I have had many requests over the years to finish so let us finish it together this is number five the Showers, Part 4 Returning Home We spent another hour and a half aimlessly driving around the outskirts of Broken Bow. I was giving directions to nowhere in particular, lost in thought about the girl from the gas station. It was entirely possible that the whole thing was my imagination getting away from me. My mind was filling in gaps in my memory with the worst possible reality. Deep down, I knew it was the truth. I saw the little oasis on the horizon before Karen and Brian. My stomach went into freefall and my vision became a tunnel. I must have steered us there without knowing it. That had to be it. Maybe you had to get lost to find the place. Maybe it sought me out. It really didn't matter kept quiet, feeling lightheaded. If I said nothing, we could just drive right by it and let it fade from our lives forever. But Brian turned the wheel towards the tree without a word of guidance from me. This was the first point where I realized how desperately I did not want to return to that place. I was sweating through layers of clothing and trying to keep my composure. Maybe we can call it a night and try again some other time, I managed to say. The words fell out of my mouth, slurred and robotic sounding. But that was the best I could do. I'm going to try that ominous looking patch of trees over there, but then I'm down for whatever you guys want to do, said Brian. I fixed in on the tree line that he was talking about as we slowly worked our way across the undisturbed field. I could feel the pool of the farmhouse in the tunnels their weight dragging us towards them. The trees appeared to shimmer in the setting sun's light. The branches extended upward, as if they were reaching for the car, beckoning us. Shit, Bob, that's pretty awful looking, Karen said. Ringing any bells? That's the place. The words went through my mind and out of my mouth in less than a second. I hardly even tried to stop them. Karen and Brian celebrated, but I just chewed at my fingernails. I had told myself countless times I would never again step foot near Broken Bow. But here I was. I would be lying if I had said I never imagined it, though, returning to the scene of my own personal horror show to somehow get some answers or cast a light on what exactly the showers were. I spent a long time forming my own personal theories about the place, but eventually, the effort seemed pointless. The truth behind them didn't matter in the end anyway. A part of them existed only within the confines of my story, what I posted on the internet and chose to show the world. They could be anything to anyone with just that account, from a meeting place for a violent ritualistic cult to a cipher experiments performed by the KKK or even deeply rooted Nazi post-World War II bunkers. I'm not dense. I know that the real fear lies in the unknown. Horror was my bread and butter. I believe that was why the story connected with some people and left others disappointed. The showers in my story are filled mostly with whatever you bring to them. For me, the showers were more complex. They existed outside of rational thought and comprehension because my experience with them had robbed me of those attributes in part. As we slowly rolled through the brush, tree branches reached out and scraped against the car's exterior, forging new grooves and playing the metal like a warped record. The sharp, 
grinding noises split my already aching head in two. I put in my earbuds to mute the noise. No music. I thanked Brian and apologized about the car while Karen looked at our surroundings like a kid who had just stepped foot in an amusement park. That place meant something to me that I hadn't considered prior to that moment and I still hadn't pieced together in its entirety. I just knew that as we began to near the clearing, I felt that I had never had a choice in making this trip. I was always going to end up back here, one way or another. Every time I told my story, Mr. Mays' story, I dug the hole a little deeper. Every drink I took to forget them, every girl I slept with to distract them, every fake fact I made up to distance myself from the real story. It just further solidified the fact that one day I would be back here. I was free to leave, go home, have all the booze and non-committal sex my body could handle. I could do those things because the showers are patient. They have time. All of my actions were simply futile attempts at prolonging the inevitable. I know how it sounds, but I'm looking back on it now and I I'm telling you the simple truth. I was always going to return to the showers because they... They were waiting for me. Brian stopped the car just short of the clearing in front of a tree that had fallen in the path before us. I could probably get us over this, but I've already scratched the shit out of your car and... This might do a number on her undercarriage, he said. We can walk, Karen said, pulling on her coat. You guys can walk. I have some smoking to do, said Brian. We came all this way and you're not even going to look around with us? Karen wasn't happy. Brian didn't seem to care. It's the journey, not the destination, Karen, he said, mugging. Besides, somebody has to keep the car warm. Neither of them moved for a few silent seconds. Brian grabbed his Ziploc-wrapped grinder from the center console without another word. Karen had been more upset with him about less before. He knew it would pass. Make good decisions, he laughed, turning up the music and turning on the headlights. Karen exited the car without another word. I gathered myself and followed, shooting an annoyed but understanding look to Brian as I went. Karen was already up the path in front of me. I was staving off a panic attack, but I ran forward to keep up. So, what do you think? I asked, trying to get her talking and not dwelling on Brian. She looked up and around, pulling out a small bottle of vodka from her jacket. We're not even on the ride yet, she grinned half-heartedly. She took a long pull from the bottle. The setting sun caught the plastic just right, and a ray of light momentarily blinded me. My head was still throbbing. She put the bottle down and I was able to see the clearing beyond her. There it was. Or rather, wasn't. The massive farmhouse that had once occupied the clearing was nowhere to be found. There was nothing there but the same untouched dirt that made up the fields around us. Karen took notice as we stepped out of the trees. It seems a bit empty, she said, disappointed. Are you sure this is the place? I was sure. My brain was still trying to tackle the absent structure. I... I y yeah, definitely, I stuttered. This is where it happened. I walked the perimeter of the clearing, sipping from my flask. My eyes were drawn to the empty space where I was certain that a massive farmhouse had once stood. It shouldn't have been strange in hindsight. Old buildings get torn down all the time. But who had done it? When? Did this mean that it hadn't been abandoned when I was there before? I couldn't wrap my mind around the situation. At the very least, there should have been some remnants of the farmhouse or evidence that the tunnels had been filled. There should have been a path in the trees carved out for the equipment that would have undoubtedly been needed to clear the structure out, but everything looked undisturbed. It looked... too clean. But this was the place. I was sure of it. I could feel it. The glow of the frosted ground was just a front. It was putting on a nice face to hide itself from me. 
I took another sip. There were no bugs, no rodents, no birds, no deer. Not so much as a spider across the tree line. It was winter, but surely there should have been something living in that place. There were no tracks or scat, just undisturbed land. It would have been picturesque if it wasn't so oppressively ominous. I felt like I was losing my mind. So where's the giant X? asked Karen. Not here, I guess. I responded with a fake sigh of disappointment. I wanted to get out of there before it could reveal itself. I felt like the pressure in the clearing was building. Like I was standing in front of a giant jack-in-the-box. I, I don't know. It has been over a decade. Come on, there has to be something here? The place was as big as you said. There has to be something left around, said Karen. You would think. I'm not sure how big it actually was, thinking back on it, I said. Kind of like when you go back to your old elementary school after years and you can touch the ceiling. I was working my way towards the car at this point, directly across the clearing. Karen circled me broadly, running around and kicking at the ground with her feet. Her eyes peeled wide. The tunnels, though, she said. The cellar door! It's a big space, I shrugged my shoulders. Trees could have overtaken it, they could have been filled. They weren't the most stable things in the first place, Karen. Karen noticed where I was heading. What are you doing? She said. I'm gonna go get warm, I told her. If it's gone, it's gone. It's probably for the best anyway. Oh, come on! We've come all this way, we aren't leaving after ten minutes, she said. It was a nice little road trip, but I'm tired and it's getting dark, babe. I put my hands in my coat and continued towards the car where Brian sat. He was ripping a bong in the back seat. Well, that's some bullshit, she said from behind me. I turned around to face her. She was powering through the vodka she had opened only minutes ago. With a flourish, she finished the bottle and whipped it over my head into the trees. I didn't hear it hit. The growing pain in my gut flared. It was surely just something to do with stress, but you can't breathe your way through an ulcer. I fell down to a knee. The ice on the ground had thinned beneath me. It was just frost and hardened earth. My chest tightened. I think we should just go. I think I need to go to an urgent care, I told her. Fucking convenient, she said. You're not getting your way in so suddenly you pull your trump card. Okay, Jack. Okay. Fine. I'll take you to an urgent care in the middle of Kansas. Nebraska, I said. She shot me a look like a bullet. Her body language shifted dramatically. Oh, I'm sorry, she said sarcastically, moving towards me. It's just that your story changes so fucking often that I don't know what the truth is. And when you're bullshitting. She picked up a rock and whipped it into the trees. It wasn't thrown at me, but it was close enough that I considered it. I didn't hear it land. My jaw popped. Let's go! Let's go to urgent care, Jack! They can give you some Ativan and tell you that you're having a panic attack again, but then we're coming back here. She was flipping. When you're in a relationship with someone with rapid mood fluctuations, you learn the signs and how to respond calmly to help make the whole situation easier for everyone. I knew her inside and out. You're being a fucking dick, dude, I said. But you also learn which buttons to push. The pain was getting to me. She stepped towards me with purpose. What in the fuck did you just... There was a dull and hollow thump beneath her boot. She froze. I froze. We both looked down to find a large set of wooden cellar doors that had been hidden by the dirt, debris, and ice. But at that moment, it seemed impossible that we had missed them. A malicious grin crawled across Karen's face as she looked up at me. Let's just go, Karen, I said. She cleared off the doors with her feet. Please, let's just go! One step, 
she said, trailing off. We have to go, please! What's down there? No. What's down there? She repeated again, her gaze jumping between me and the door. What's down there? Her voice was getting loud there. Make something up, Hemingway! She was yelling. What? You call yourself a writer that doesn't write, Jack? My gut felt like it was bursting. I was frustrated and kind of drunk and stuck in a fog and thinking about the girl at the gas station and how Brian was being rude and Karen was just trying to hurt me. She was just baiting me at that point. I bit hard. Oh, fuck you. You made me do this. I never wanted to come back here and you made me and now you're going to chastise me because it doesn't live up to your expectations. I felt unexpected tears fall down my cheek. It's just a fucking story, Karen. A horror story. Horror as in afraid and story as in you were fucking there so you don't fucking know. You don't know what happened. I could have made it all up. I did. For you and every other girl I told it to. I felt angry. A bubble of fear was growing inside of me. I, I wouldn't... You made me come here. And I, I would never make you go back to... I stopped myself. I felt guilty. I had drawn a line and crossed it with only half a slurred sentence. Karen's shoulders dropped and her gaze shifted to the dirt at her feet. She then walked forward filling the gap between us in an instant. And in one swift motion, she punched me in the face. I felt very little. Tell me what you're so fucking afraid of, you lying little cunt. She breathed through gritted teeth, staring a hole through my chest. I said nothing. It was my only course of action. I'm a big bad hero in your stories, Facing down anything that comes in your way. Well, I'm standing right here, Jack. So tell me, what are you so afraid of? That you would blow us up to avoid it? I had nothing. I don't know. I uttered under my breath. I could feel myself begin to wobble and sway, but it wasn't the booze. It felt like my body was confused, like my brain was playing catch-up and had left everything else on standby. It was the truth. I had no idea what was waiting for us in that tunnel. I couldn't muster a name or even a vague description because I couldn't remember. I had spent so much time embellishing and lying about it to reach certain ends that I had never really processed what had happened to me there. I never thought about how it changed my perception of myself, let alone my perception of reality. I never thought about, I never thought about it because I never, I never had to think about it. I just turned it into a story. And then I spread the story. I was doing the same thing Mr. Mays had done, just on a larger scale, lie. I distanced myself enough from the reality of the situation because it was easier to swallow. And most importantly, it was under control. But here I was now, being forced to face it again, and I had no control. It's a dark, dirt, fucking pit in the middle of fucking Nebraska, Jack. That's all, she taunted, taking a single step down into the darkness, swaying the whole time. I'm going in without you. Fuck it. Please don't, I begged, screaming. I was lost in the depths of a panic attack at that point, but I couldn't figure out the exact reason why it was happening. It's like I knew the reality of what waited in the darkness, but wasn't able to articulate it clearly. What do you see, Jack? I remembered the voice and the fear, but not the answer. Karen took a couple steps downward. Darkness swallowed her to her hips. Don't wait up. She smiled, mocking me and disappearing into the cellar. She let the heavy door fall above her. It landed with a muted thud and puff of dust. 
The clearing around me fell silent. I could hear bits of the frost-covered ground crackling quietly around me as my body heat escaped. I stood up and looked at my car's headlights glowing bright in the distance. Brian was likely passed out in the back at this point, wrapped in his sleeping bag. I couldn't bring him with me anyways. I don't think I was allowed. I stared at the cellar door. I could hear no sound coming from below. There was no pressing need to go down there at all. If I waited quietly right there, I had no doubt that Karen would emerge no worse for wear. She would give me shit about being a coward, we would all sleep it off in the car, and then drive off towards our regular life back home. Maybe this was close enough. I had come back to the showers once again despite my fears, and maybe now I could finally let it go. Karen had seen the birthplace of the story she obsessed over, and I had confronted whatever it was I needed to confront there. Nothing more needed to be done. After all, the farmhouse was gone, the land had frozen over, and it seemed like the place had been completely abandoned. It would never take anyone again. It would never hurt anyone again. All I had to do was stay right there on the ground and wait. Within seconds, I was staring into the beckoning darkness of the cellar. The moonlight hardly seemed to pierce the black veil as I made one hesitant step downward, followed by another. The door was heavier than I remembered, but what did I know? My memory was terrible. I inched my way down the icy ramp. I watched my feet disappear beneath me, swallowed by the darkness. It took my legs next, but I was helping it along. Even through thick pants and boots, the darkness felt a great deal colder than it should have. My legs felt like they were submerged in ice water. I was in up to my knees when I felt a familiar shooting pain in my right leg, one that I hadn't felt in years. I knew it was psychosemantic because it had to be. But it ran up my leg so quickly that I grabbed at it on reflex alone. I had shifted all of my weight onto my left leg, which had tried to root itself in a patch of thin ice. Of course it did. I tumbled downward into the abyss. The heavy cellar door fell behind me with a crash. All traces of light from the outside had been snuffed out by the door. The fall seemed to last longer than it should have, but maybe I was just panicked and unable to properly gauge the passage of time. I landed hard on my shoulder, which took most of the impact. My head was second place. My shoulder hit, my neck whipped, and my head bounced hard on the ground. I think I lost consciousness, but it was difficult to tell. My waking environment was already silent, pitch black and freezing cold, so there was really little difference between conscious and unconscious at that point. I don't know how long I laid there, but I know I wanted to stay put as I felt the pain shooting across my skull. I rolled onto my back, groaning loudly but unable to hear it well. It sure as hell sounded like I was underwater. I reached my bare hand into my pocket to grab my phone. In hindsight, I don't know what I was doing trying to walk down there without a light. I hadn't been thinking clearly. I hadn't been thinking at all. I removed the phone from my pocket and pressed the home button to find a web of broken glass covering a picture of Karen and I, my phone's wallpaper. It was a selfie that she had taken of the two of us, at what could have been any one of the numerous local breweries that we frequented. Her eyes were closed and she was smirking while kissing me on the cheek. I was half smiling, my hair a greasy mess. My eyes were tinted red. I wasn't subtle. I don't even remember that night. The screen flashed a message about a corrupt SD card followed by one about a low battery. I had done a number on it in the fall. I swiped my thumb across the screen to turn on the flashlight. I could feel tiny pieces of fractured glass grind against my thumb. Just get me through this and I'll buy you a nice new screen, I whispered to my inanimate companion. I had to fill the silence with something, still... My own voice sounded distant and muted. 
I opened my jaw wide to try and alleviate the pain in my head. It cracked four times in rapid succession like bubble wrap, but the pain persisted. The light from my phone flickered to life, illuminating my surroundings. It wasn't as bright as I would have expected. Either my phone light was dying or those tunnels were eating the light, keeping it from showing me more than it wanted me to see. But I could see enough. The little details came rushing back to me instantaneously, gaps in my memories, filling so quickly that it made me dizzy. Were they really gaps, though? No, they had just been pushed to the side, overlooked, covered up. My leg began to throb like it had when I fell through the floor on the now-demolished farmhouse so many years ago. I wondered if that hole was still there, holding on to the piece of denim that it stole from my jeans. I heard feet shuffling behind me, in front of me, all around me. Every step I took was slow and careful and deliberate, but still there was a brief delay and another step directly following my own. I told myself that it was just the echo. That place had an echo, but it shouldn't have. The familiar putrid stench burned my nostrils. It burned my eyes and made my now surely decaying stomach clench in an attempt to force me to vomit. Much to my dismay, I just gagged violently. It lit up parts of my memory that I can't properly verbalize, like the smell a home-cooked meal or your childhood home brings, but instead of feeling comfort, I felt anger. I hadn't thought about that awful stench in years, but I couldn't grasp how I could have possibly forgotten. It had always been right there. How had I let it get away from me? And then I saw her. The child in the stained robe with the black hair. She was twitching in the distance, just on the border of my peripheral vision. Her skin was pale and her hair ran like vines down to her knees. Her gown was just as tattered as the last time we had met. She was gone with a blink. I turned away. I had seen her since. She had been in my nightmares, waiting for me. It was coming back to me. I would just wake up and move on with my day afterwards, but how could I in hindsight? I turned back. She was directly in front of me. I could feel her breath warm against my face. Could I? Her breath smelled like death, but did it? Her hair hung over my face. Only her eye was visible as it reflected the light of my... There, there, there was no light. There was no girl. There, there couldn't be. It was pitch black. I felt for a wall, and my hand brushed against cold sheet metal, the kind that would have been used as roofing on a barn. It was rusted and brittle. I grounded myself. The smell remained. All of my lies, half-truths and made-up details about that place were stripped away. There was no more hiding from it, no more deflecting the truth. I was back in the place I had sworn to never revisit, but was always heading back towards. I had to laugh. <laughs> he probably sounded like I was losing it. Years of sleeping on couches and subletting rooms, and I had never gotten comfortable with any of them. But somehow, in this godforsaken place, I found at the very least some familiarity. It was like a fucked up home because as much distance as I put between us, it had stuck with me. It was part of me. That seemed about right. I was walking through a haunted house of my own making. In my delirium, I began to wonder if that place had really been there for me. Was it even around before me? Had I called it into existence, was Mr. Mays just a kook who had inadvertently put me on a path toward manifesting this place of filth and evil? Was this a prison that I had constructed for myself, a tomb that I was always meant to die in? I reeled myself back in. It was like the dark and silent void was calling out for me to fill it, so my mind was attempting to do so just by letting anything and everything fly forth. But there was too much space to fill. It would be way too easy to get lost there. That's how people lose their minds, isn't it? I told myself that I was going to go back on medication when I got out of there. I would need some Xanax at the very least. My light went out. I heard the familiar cry of an animal in the distance. It was coming from right in front of me. No, it was a voice. It was, 
It was the animal again, a dying doe. It was wailing so loud. It was in pain. I was in pain. The wailing was coming from within my head. The light flickered back to life for a moment. I took in the nothing that stood before me. I needed the light. When I lost it, I immediately began to lose myself. I was likely to spread out across that place in an instant, and the light was the only thing that kept me there confined but safe. I was in the realm of the known. Anything outside of that was where the real horror waited. A flash of bright red appeared in my peripheral vision. Of course, how could I have forgotten it? I turned to face the red door. It would have looked out of place in a model home in white suburbia, yet here it was. Out of element just like me, the door faded, and my light died once again. It was, it was, it was for good this time. I, I calmed, I, I calmly told myself over and over again that when deprived of sight or sound, the brain will hallucinate, populating the glaring gaps with whatever it can. None of this was real. I, I was, I was in a hole in the ground in the middle of Nebraska and I was not going to lose myself there. I was wandering blindly through the darkness when I heard Mr. Mays' voice. It was not the joyful and calming one from the classroom, but the dejected, drunken voice from the bar. That's a bad place, Jack. I could smell the liquor on his breath, like he was sitting in front of me once again. Cops. Drunk. Taken by wildlife. I could hear him slurring his words. I punched the wall in front of me. I heard only a muffled thud while the brittle and rusted metal siding that covered the interior of the tunnel fractured. It shaved the skin off my knuckles. I wish they'd have found the body, though. Then we could have shown them. I felt nothing but the warm blood rushing down my fingers. This place was taunting me! I'm pretty sure I screamed out. I, I, I couldn't tell. I just needed a drink to rein my thoughts back into control. My memories were populating the seemingly infinite space around me. And the only thing I wanted was for them to quiet down so I could hear myself think. I fell to my knees. This is what it wanted, this place. Even though it couldn't want. No, 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 no. I did this to myself. I wrote this ending for myself when I went chasing the infamous showers and posted about it on the internet. I built this extension for myself that was now eating me. It truly was just a hole in the ground in motherfucking Nebraska that I used to dump my own fears into. Nothing more. I was going to end up just like Mr. Mays. Karen was right. The room began to quiet and I could feel it shrinking. Fucking hell on earth if you ask me. It was him again, but this time I was more acutely aware of the sadness, the uncertainty, the fear in his voice. I closed my eyes. Not that it mattered much. I told myself the truth. Mr. Mays was just a tired old man. I couldn't tell if I was speaking it out loud or not. He, he had a horrific experience in his younger years, but because of it, he had lost a friend. The situation was as simple as that. Maybe they did find his friend's body. Maybe they didn't. It really didn't matter. Mr. Mays just couldn't cope with emotional drama, so grandiose, and he drank himself stupid to shrink it down to a manageable size, something small enough to hide away and check in on a really bad night every now and again, but he was still the driving force behind everything he did. I didn't realize what I was actually doing at the time, but if you just replace his name with mine, it might make some sense. I felt something creak from above me and felt a drop of something on my shoulder. But my attention was quickly stolen by something else. Jack? The voice cut through the silence with a knife. And I perked up. My heart was back to 200 beats per minute. My brain was on fire, so it took me a second to process what was happening. Karen is a person. Karen is my girlfriend. Karen went into the tunnel. I went after Karen. We are both in the tunnel now. Karen just spoke. Karen, come closer to me. Come over. You were... You were talking to yourself. She said. Her voice was soft and she sounded concerned. You were talking to yourself like you were sleeping just now. Why wouldn't you bring me here? This was the venue in which... I finally had a real conversation with my girlfriend. 
a subground living nightmare in the pitch black as a disembodied voice. I don't know, I replied. She was audibly upset. <laughs> after, after everything I've given up for you, you're still going to feed me that bullshit? I mean it. I, I mean it. I, I don't know. I don't know what this place is. I don't know what happened to me here. I can't explain any of this. Can you? There was a beat. I was pleading with her but didn't know what my goal was. I was just letting everything out. So I, I don't... I don't know what this place is. Or what it did to me. Except that I wasn't the same after it. I'm, I'm just fucked up and, and I don't know why. I can't do anything about it. And I would never want to put you through that. I was afraid. I mean, look at this place. I gestured all around me, but neither of us could see. I could have helped you, she said, quietly. I noticed the past tense, too. I could hear her either moving toward me or resting against the wall near her. How? We could have shared it. I heard the tears in her voice. I didn't know what to say. Well, we are now. 